My name is uh, Anders, and I'm assistant professor at uh, King's College London. And uh, research interests, I will say, I I tend to gravitate towards themes related to technology and innovation, uh, industry evolution. I like things on the macro level, typically, and I like things that have some kind of component of technological change. My personal journey is I started in philosophy and um, then I slowly uh, became a sellout and went to, uh, went to business. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's a very interesting project. I got together with my dear co-author Sarah Lara Marquez from uh, De Montfort University in the UK. She's at a, at a design and fashion school. There. So we look at how uh, commercial academic publishers, the companies who run the journals we send our papers to, how they respond to this open access social movement. So a social movement that try to transform the publishing landscape into something with no paywalls, no subscription fees, and more like a free flowing uh, community organized uh, world of uh, academic knowledge floating around. Uh, a commons is usually the term used. Um, so it was a very, very visionary and idealistic idea. And in the beginning, in the UK especially, and across many places in the world, uh, it was an idea that got a lot of momentum and also a lot of support amongst policymakers and research funders, etc. And if we turn back time to around um, the, the mid-2000s, uh, these, uh, these publishing companies, uh, they faced a very severe, severe threat that a lot of policymakers in the UK especially uh, wanted to implement many of the social movements ideas, uh, not, not a one-to-one, -one, but, but um, in quite intact form, I would say, which uh, would imply that uh, many of these um, commercial academic publishing companies would not really be able to have as... Um, as profitable a position in the academic publishing world as they, as they had at the time, uh, far from. Uh, but what we found is that despite of this uh, initial uh, threat, if you will, uh, they were able to uh, change uh, the, the ideas and the expectations towards what open access uh, could mean. Uh, and uh, as a result, they could create this new, uh, very, very powerful uh, market opportunity. And, and what we find that they, that they did, and I think what is, is useful for uh, probably a lot of social movements and a lot of, um, a lot of activist groups to, uh, to take in, into consideration, is that if you are in a social movement and you have some very idealistic and visionary ideas, uh, to implement them or get them to actually have an impact on the world, most likely you need the support from some kind of powerful third-party actor. It could be government, it could be the media, it could be large consumer groups, what have you. But uh, the very idealistic and visionary ideas that you needed to probably mobilize uh, members in your movement, to create excitement, etc., uh, they can be a double-edged sword because if you have very idealistic and, and radical ideas, uh, often your, your overlap with more mainstream or powerful actors, that overlap in values and interests will tend to be uh, fairly narrow uh, because you come from more the periphery and you have wild and visionary ideas. Uh, and that makes it very, very easy for, um, for other players in, in whatever market or industry or field you are to offer a, an alternative spin on your, uh, your ideas as a social movement, to offer an alternative spin that not only has a higher overlap with the interests and concerns of, uh, of uh, whatever powerful third party stakeholder, regulators, etc., that you need the support of, uh, you can, you can um, create a, a version that appeals better to them, uh, while at the same time is consistent uh, with your own um, uh, economic interests. So in that sense, we, we, we find that uh, powerful ideas that dramatically could change the, change the field and undermine the, the position of, uh, of incumbent organizations, incumbent organizations can uh, exploit the idealism of social movements 
and create an alternative spin on their ideas that is better aligned with mainstream actors in order to create a new powerful market opportunity. In the case of open access publishing, um, uh, history uh, has spoken very clearly there. It, it has been the uh, tradition away from uh, subscriptions to instead uh, folk, instead of charging uh, the reader or the library, uh, you charge the, the author uh, publishing charges. And, and by redefining what open access means, like instead of pay to read, pay to publish, you have been able to move beyond some library budgets that already were very, very drained, to say the least. You had something going on for ages called the serial crisis. Instead, you were able to uh, address many new kinds of budgets that weren't stagnant or drained, like the library budgets, because you moved the business model away from the reader pace to the author pace. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a very interesting uh, message, I think, in terms of like what social movements can do in order to uh, lower the chance of getting co-opted by, uh, by the organizations they target. Yeah, so I have, uh, for example, uh, a new project with uh, two colleagues, uh, Slatko Bodrosik from, uh, from Leeds University and uh, Rasmus uh, Kors Hartmann from uh, Copenhagen Business School. And uh, what we look at is um, how the cultural celebration of entrepreneurship uh, changes over time. So um, currently, or at least until fairly recently, we have lived in a time that really, really have glorified entrepreneurship. And, and uh, not only have uh, entrepreneurship been seen as a powerful engine of economic growth and innovation, which it rightly has been, um, also entrepreneurship has been seen as in many ways superior to a, a stable, boring, waged employment in larger organizations. Uh, and you see in examples of entrepreneurs being uh, consulted for all kinds of uh, questions about life and society and etc. Uh, apart from their sort of more narrowly defined domain of creating businesses and bringing innovation to market etc. Um, so that cultural celebration of entrepreneurship, um, sometimes called entrepreneurialism, uh, some authors have argued that that is something that emerged in the in the late seventies and and really got uh, got some momentum in the 80s with neoliberalism. And it was something that they would argue has been, uh, is a fairly recent phenomenon and has accumulated uh, in a linear fashion uh, since then. And then uh, you would assume that it's not really going to stop. It just keeps on uh, going. Uh, so we, we, we try to uh, look historically and explore this um, this development in, in greater detail. And what we what we did was that we looked, taking a new show material perspective, you know, uh, society has been through these different uh, technological revolutions with like uh, steam, uh, oil, electricity, etc., computers. Uh, and we looked at each major technological revo revolution in society. We, we see that there is a new cycle of entrepreneurialism, if you will, that as new entrepreneurs start to create uh, large companies commercializing uh, the, the focal technology of the revolution, uh, a new uh, wave of cultural celebration of entrepreneurship emerges, but it, 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 never, uh, it never continues uh, throughout in a, in a linear fashion, as, um, as some, some have assumed, but rather at a certain point in time, the technology will hit some kind of a, some kind of crisis. Uh, it could be the burst of a major techno technological bubble. Uh, also, there will still be some uh, some societal consequences, such as increase in income inequality. Uh, individuals involved with the new technology revolution will uh, make much more money than people involved in other domains of society that will create uh, that has created civil unrest, for example. Um, so there's this there's this uh, tipping point where all of a sudden problems accumulate. Uh, and uh, a, a bubble or some kind of other uh, jolt uh, triggers a change in sentiment. Often this change in sentiment has been building up. So you will see that as some very iconic entrepreneurs uh, become big heroes of an era, uh, they start to 
sort of um, be a little bit more uh, laissez-faire in terms of how they uh, represent themselves in media, what the what kind of statements they make, uh, what kind of um, political or ideological endorsements they make publicly. Uh, so you have some some early signs of a changing public sentiment, typically catalyzed by some kind of jolt, a crisis, a bubble that bursts, what have you, and that will spark a transition from. Uh, you know, entrepreneurs being seen as heroes in society to uh, to, to to villains. Um, eventually, uh, that that will uh, that will all stagnate and, and people care about other things. But then uh, it stays like that until a new technological revolution starts a new uh, cycle of cultural celebration of entrepreneurship. And if history is going to repeat itself. And I will say that's a big topic in neo schumpeterian theory why this last technological revolution has been a bit strange and compared to the other ones, it doesn't follow the same uh, exact patterns uh, in terms of crisis and etc. But if history is going to repeat itself, then we are currently in a period that is very, very similar to how it has been historically when entrepreneurship has moved from cultural celebration uh, to where you have more been focused on the uh, perhaps potential problematic aspects in society and you focus more on social reform and entrepreneurship moves away from being uh, the ideal type of employment and value creation to being um, uh, to, to the ideal moving to other uh, types of organizing um, character personas. Oh, I think uh, definitely something I'll emphasize is that um, to be uh, to be careful about going all in on open coding. So I think a lot of a lot of um, people starting to do uh, inductive qualitative research, uh, they will start with uh, going through a ton of data and. Um, it, it uh, categorize the data into uh, various uh, themes that they that they identify in it, and uh, uh, that that can definitely also be a, a productive uh, exercise. But with digitalization and the unlimited amount of uh, online archival um, data that is available to us at our fingertips, uh, this can be a, a potentially risky strategy because. Uh, when you don't know exactly, uh, or at least you will never know exactly what you're looking for, but when you don't have a must that guides you, uh, you don't really uh, know what to look for and you don't really know uh, when to stop and you don't know what is important and what is not important. And if data more or less can continue like way beyond the human capacity uh, for your uh, two human eyes, um, it, it, it's, it's simply something that can... Uh, go on forever and you will never really be able to uh, move beyond the, the initial stage of, um, of exploring the data. Uh, in some, in some um, uh, qualitative uh, analysis textbooks, there's this idea of a, of a grand tour question uh, that will typically be a, a better way to start where you more explore the data in terms of see, seeing out what are sort of like, what's the overall uh, patterns and puzzles within the data uh, before you really start to commit to any kind of, of, of systematic coding of it. And then when you identify some puzzles and you really know what are the, what are the questions that you're really looking for in the, in the data, then you can start to uh, code, more, uh, code more systematically. In qualitative research, um, it's often, uh, it's often the idea that the kind of sampling you do is uh, theoretical sampling. So you, you sample a little bit ad hoc in terms of what is uh, of your theoretical, uh, theoretical interest. Uh, where you leave something like um, a more uh, representative or stratified sampling to your quantitative uh, colleagues. Uh, but uh, there, there are, I would say that there are many uh, scenarios when doing archival work uh, where doing some kind of stratified sample uh, that is not not theoretical sample uh, might be very meaningful uh, because 
uh, if data is, uh, the, the volume of data can be so gigantic in terms of what you can simply uh, download pretty quickly from, um, from Factiva or what have you, most likely it won't be viable to just uh, go about it iteratively uh, sample theoretically. You might have to do some kind of stratified sample, for example, okay, let's say you, you download uh, thousands of documents about an industry you're interested in, uh, then you might look at, okay, I look at the, um, uh, the articles published in, in January, for example, uh, through each, the, each of the years that you're looking at if you're doing a longitudinal study. Uh, and then starting out like that with a, with a smaller byte of the, of the data that will give you a sense of it, uh, rather than going all out, uh, open coding uh, the whole thing, which will take, uh, take forever. So I think even though it's typically not uh, that common in quality research, I think it's important not to be too afraid to go into some kind of stratified sampling. Um, it probably shouldn't be random either because there might be a lot of uh, asymmetries in the data over time. I think for most archival projects, you have the, 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 the phase of scenario, there'll be much more data in the later part of your time period than the early one. So if it's random, uh, the sampling, you might, um, you know, you might skew the data set towards uh, the time periods or certain access perhaps or certain data sources. Uh, where there's just much more availability than in others. Uh, so it's important to have a stratified sample that it could be across, let's say, time, it could be across actors, so that you get something that uh, takes asymmetries into, a, into account like that. Um, then there's something about um, uh, when do you read uh, data saturation? So often when you talk about data saturation, uh, there's multiple ways that people talk about when they know they have hit it. Uh, but usually you will have a, an account such as uh, that's when you uh, stop learning uh, or gain new insights from, uh, from additional data. And the problem with, uh, with that um, rule of thumb uh, when it comes to archival material is that uh, you, you, can, um, you not only can go on sampling uh, forever almost, you, can al you always have extremely uh, diverse array of sources. Um, so not only can uh, it continue forever, but also the added complexity you can, get, uh, you can get to your study can also increase tremendously because uh, you, have, you have so heterogeneous uh, sources. And that's where it's important to, to start uh, building a theoretical model or whatever form your theoretical contribution will have uh, throughout the process. Start creating a, a theoretical scaffold, some kind of sketch of what your theory will be, and then uh, refine that and have, so that it gradually can converge with, uh, with the sample you're making. And that's very important because before you have an idea about what your theory is, you don't really know uh, when do you no longer need added complexity. Um, so um, at the end of the day, there's a classic uh, concept in, in philosophy, uh, Occam's razor. Uh, the core of the idea is basically that if, if, a, if an entity uh, is no, is placed no, uh, has served no need in terms of uh, explaining some kind of manifestation, then you can sort of like cut it out as, uh, as, as redundant. And I think it's very important to, to think in those terms when it comes to archival material that you, you can add, let's say, entirely new kinds of sources that will add new uh, con um, complexity to your model. But at a certain point in time, you will probably he hit a peak complexity in order to explain what you're trying to explain, whether it's an outcome in your data or what it is. Uh, and it's not really before that that you know that you have really hit uh, uh, saturation when before you know that, okay, uh, this sort of like uh, um, tipping point where you no longer add explanatory power to your model has been reached because you will the, the idea of not learning anything new, that will go on forever because the data is so uh, diverse and you can constantly add new dimensions. Uh, so it's it's more focused taking this more Occam ratio is approach to um, uh, peak complexity versus um, explanatory power.
Yeah, uh, oh, I don't know about more attention. I mean, uh, I hope people read it and I hope people will, will like it. But um, it's also, it got out fairly recently. So, um, but uh, yeah, I, ho- I do hope people will like it and read it. Um, it's about uh, the aesthetic evolution of product categories. It's a paper I did with my co-author, Stina Grodal. I think she was here in the studio five years ago <laughs> or something. Uh, and um, it's out now in Administrative Science Quarterly. And it's a, it's a study where we look at um, how uh, the hearing aid product category, uh, industry very close to my heart, evolved aesthetically uh, over time. So we track the aesthetics of hearing aids over a 70 year period of time, for instance, uh, 1945 until 2015. And uh, uh, what's very interesting there is that uh, we have a lot of typically case studies of uh, how uh, certain producers have made a very, very powerful differentiation within their product categories by coming up with a radically new uh, aesthetic that changes the game completely. Uh, But usually uh, those kind of innovations uh, they are quite rare. And I mean, from a, I guess, naive perspective, you assume, but uh, when you have a kind of innovation that has a high commercial potential and it doesn't intuitively require as much R&D time and cost as, a, let's say, a technological breakthrough, uh, why don't producers do it more often, uh, you might ask. Uh, so that is really a, a puzzle that we try to answer and see um what what are sort of like the, the the patterns over time in terms of how uh, aesthetics of a product category evolves and what are producers sort of uh, underlying ideas about when do they try to change aesthetics uh, when do they try to stick to what we call a dominant aesthetic within the product category uh, etc and we find that it's not really so uh, um, when um, when an aesthetic becomes a dominant within a product category, it's because that there's a almost collective I- collective or shared idea within an industry that this is how the product is supposed to look. If you deviate from this aesthetic, then uh, consumers don't want it, or it will be seen as off or strange or what have you. Uh, so once an aesthetic has become established, a certain combination of color, shape, a silhouette, a, a surface texture, these kind of things. Once they become dominant, producers think that that's how the product is supposed to look, and and they are, they um, they almost uh, forget that uh, it it could uh, could look different. Uh, but then what what tends to happen is that time changes, and the cultural meanings of uh, of that aesthetic that at a certain point in time helped its commercialization and had a good fit with uh, con- what, what meanings and values consumers sought for, some changes in society might disrupt that. So, for example, we look at how, at a certain point in time, positioning hearing aids as medical devices was very, very good for the hearing aid industry because it legitimized the industry. It may have it seen as more serious and credible. But what happened? All of a sudden, the cultural meanings around aging changes uh, people don't no longer, no longer want to be seen as old when they age. They want to be seen as young forever. Uh, and walking around with something that is uh, clearly positioned as a medical device is not super uh, coherent with that aspiration. So uh, all of a sudden there was a mismatch between positioning the hearing aid as a medical device and uh, people's new, uh, the new cultural understanding of aging and an idealization of youthfulness. Producers were very slow to realize this. It was it took quite a while before they realized this misalignment, and they had suffered um, a lot of uh, adoption barriers uh, for, for for quite long. Um, eventually, uh, once um, a technological change hit the industry, where they could change the architecture of the product completely. Um, then they would it would serve as sort of like a, a jolt or spark where all of a sudden the technology allowed for some completely new design possibilities in a hearing aid. Basically, you move the speaker from uh, inside the hearing aid to uh, detach from the hearing aid through a little thin wire. Uh, and that gave designers completely new possibilities to design the product. And that made them think, hmm, how should it look like now? And then they would... Uh, 
finally draw upon this latent realization that the meanings associations of hearing aids were out of touch with reality, uh, they would leverage all that in, in uh, designing a hearing aid using this new technology. So we find that, that not only there has to be this latent accumulated realization that the meanings of the product category uh, has become misaligned with the times, but also there has to be some kind of material shock that jolts producers to uh, to reconsider uh, how what are the possibilities for how this product category could uh, could look. Uh, thanks a lot for having me. It has been uh, wonderful to be uh, here in uh, in Lyon. Uh, it's um, beautiful place, uh, great, great food, good things to eat, uh, great, uh, great company. And uh, it's been a pleasure visiting your wonderful school here.